Hi, I'm John Kasrabi, Managing Attorney of the JQK Immigration Law Firm, helping couples from across the world come and live in the United States as permanent residents and future citizens. And today I want to talk about the timelines associated with the marriage green card process. You know, that's the number one question that comes up when people are asking you about their case, whether they're starting it, whether they started already, or whether they're you know almost done with it. How long is this going to take? When is it going to be over? Well, I'm going to discuss what the answer to that is, which unfortunately is not the best answer because it's not clear and it's different in every case. But I'm going to explain why that is so you get a general understanding of the timelines associated with various types of marriage green card cases, along with other aspects of it, the work permit, travel permission, social security cards, getting in the mail, and later on, if you have a CR1 conditional residency, how to do removal conditions. Well, not how to do it, but how long it should take on average. But again, these vary drastically, but we'll discuss in a sec. All right, thanks again for joining this video. We're gonna go over the timelines associated with the marriage green card process, which is, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the most important parts of the case for, for my clients who call me, and even non-clients, people who contact me by video, on comments in my videos, or text me, or message me on TikTok, and all the various applications, they're always asking, how long does it take? When is my interview gonna happen? And we're gonna discuss how that happens, how you, you gotta think about it, and how to be prepared for those timelines, which is, you gotta wait, because it's different for every case, and the government is slow many times. So let's jump into it right now. So first of all, we have to look as to what kind of case you're doing. In general, it's a marriage case, we know that, but there's different types of those marriage kind of cases. There's cases where it might be a fiance case, there's cases where it might be a marriage, but the foreign spouse is overseas, or maybe the foreign spouse is in the United States. And we'll talk later about cases where the foreign spouse needs what's called a waiver, either an I-601A waiver or I-601 waiver, which increases the timelines involved with the case as well. But let's start with a simple version of this. Let's say uh, you're a US citizen uh, and you're marrying a foreign national who's already in the United States lawfully without any what's called inadmissibility issues. In those kind of cases, you could file the Form I-130 petition along with the I-485 adjustment of status together and eventually have an interview at the local field office. So let's talk about timelines for this. When you have a, a combo case like that, you need to check the USCIS.gov website for their timelines for an adjustment of status I-485 family-based case at the local field office, a field office for USCIS that's local to you and how long those cases take. Now, when you go to USCIS.gov and you check their case processing times, they're gonna give some numbers there and you have to understand what those numbers generally mean. Uh, they're gonna quote you a number like, you know, between five months and 20 months or something like that. The first number, let's say the five months, is a time it takes at least 50% of those cases to be completed. In the second number that's longer, that's how, many, how long it took for 93% of cases to be completed. Uh, now this is completion, not the interview, but completion, because sometimes you'll have an interview and you won't be approved at that time. So if right now in Los Angeles, for example, where I have my main practice, uh, when I do a marriage case, uh, the website says it takes anywhere from between 11 to 36 months. See, it's a, it's a wide time range that goes, but obviously there are cases that take 36 months. Now, even though it says 11 to 36 months, in reality, in my cases, usually they take three to five months before COVID-19 hit and things shut down. So even though uh, these websites give these timelines, my actual cases go much faster, but there are cases, as you see at USCIS.gov timelines, that take 36 months or even more. So that's why it's really hard to tell somebody right off the bat how long their case is gonna, case is gonna take because it varies so drastically. But that's how you gotta think about it. If you're doing the United States, it really depends on how busy that field office is to give you an interview because um, you might have an office that doesn't have much going on and so they could schedule an interview really fast or you might have another office that's short staffed and so they can't schedule your interview because uh, they don't have enough people to do your interview there. And these factors uh, play a major role and we have no control over them or knowledge because this is internal staffing issues that we probably will not be made aware of and so we never know how long the interview is gonna take to happen. Now, even if the interview does happen, it's not necessarily the case that your case will get approved right at the interview. Many times nowadays, especially under President Trump's administration, they will not approve the case right there. One, because the computer breaks down pretty frequently, so they can't even finalize the case there. But secondly, they want a superior officer, supervisor to review it as well and to do some additional reviews and background checks. So it might take a week, 
sometimes many, many months. And there's no deadline as to how long it'll take. Now, they'll give you a paper that says, oh, follow up with us in 120 days. That 120 days is not a deadline. It just gives them more time breathing room without you hassling them about the case and how long it's taking, but it could take much longer. There are cases, especially if they think there's fraud involved after the interview, where it might take one, two, or three years before you make a final decision or they make a final decision on your case because they're doing deep research, uh, having a fraud investigation, come to your house, checking you out, and it could take years before they make a final determination, which is usually a negative determination. So you gotta be prepared for all that, and that varies. And when you contact me as an attorney, when I don't know the details of your case, I don't know how your interview went or how well prepared you are, it's hard for me to know if it's going to be one of those cases that take years or one of the fast ones. Now, along with that, even before we get to the interview, sometimes some cases will have what's called a request for evidence, an RFE, where they'll ask for more information. Well, it might take you several months to get the information together to submit it to the government, and then it may take them many more months just to even get a chance to review the information that you gave them. There's no deadline on that either. So as you see, um, although a case may take you know maybe five months or six months or seven months for some people to complete the process in the United States, if you have an RFP, if your interview doesn't go well, if the computer breaks and an officer can't make a determination there, these timelines go out the window and anything goes. So you gotta be very prepared uh, for these kind of situations. But in general, a case that's happening within the United States and most cities without you know, COVID-19 situations where things are closed down or really you know, special issues that don't happen frequently, normally it'll take about a year, but it could be longer. I wouldn't be surprised if it was, or I wouldn't be surprised if it was much less. Now, the next thing that pops up is, well, we had our interview, we got an approval notice, how long does it take for the green card to actually arrive? Now, many times at the interview, the officer says, you know, wait two months uh, before the green card will arrive. In reality, as long as the computer systems and the post office do it well, most of my cases get the green card, you know, one to two weeks after the interview. It's pretty fast, pretty quick, but things happen. Things get lost along the way all the time. You know, post office loses stuff. Many times they'll say it's delivered, even though it was not delivered and blame you and force you to pay to get a new green card. And speaking of things getting lost, even before the approval, when you submit stuff, things get lost, lost all the time with USCIS. They're dealing with millions of cases, so every once in a while things get lost and that could cause some delays as well. So be prepared for all these different wild cards that could affect the timeline of your case. So that was the timelines, the general ideas behind getting a marriage green card from within the United States. However, what are the timelines if your foreign spouse is overseas and they're gonna go through the embassy system? Well, let's talk about it for a second. For those, there's two steps to the process. First, you file form I-130 petition for alien relative for the foreign spouse. And that petition timeline could vary drastically. And this will be based on several factors. One is, is the US person that's filing for the foreign spouse a citizen or a green card holder because their timelines are different as to how long USCIS will take to adjudicate those. Right now, when I check the USCIS processing times when I recorded this, for US citizen spouse I-130 cases, they were giving estimates for most of the service centers, the locations that review these, and from anywhere between four and a half months to 12 and a half months. However, the Vermont Service Center has it as high as 26 and a half months, which is just crazy. I've never seen that. Most of my I-130 marriage cases take between six months to 10 months, but I have some that take a year even. That's the average I've seen it, but obviously there are cases that take much longer and that's how they came up with these statistics on their websites. Now, LPR cases, a green card holder cases or permanent resident cases, spouses of those people are treated differently. Typically there's more of a delay for those because there's usually a backlog of those kind of cases. The way the immigration is set up, if you're a spouse of a US citizen, there's no built in line or limitation on the number of cases that can be filed for that year. They say if you're a spouse of a US citizen, just file and the bureaucracy will take time to process your case, but there's no additional limits to how many people that are spouse of US citizens can file. That's in contrast to spouses of green card holders. Every year, only a certain number of spouses of green card holders could get a green card. Because of that, when there's a lot of people filing, there's only a partial amount of that that can get approved in a year, and the rest go into a backlog. So there's automatically delays in there most of the time, and because of that, their I-130 petitions have less of a priority in processing because they know there's a backlog. Now, when I'm recording this, it's been about a year. That's been no backlog. The, the, uh, so few people that are spouses of green card holders have filed for a green card that the annual limitation on that type of case has not been met. So it, it creates the same kind of uh, you know, timelines which should be similar to spouses of U.S. citizens, but in practice, that does not happen. So as I said, a U.S. citizen spouse case could take you know, less than a year. A green card spouse holder case, 
could easily take more than a year, maybe 14 months. Uh, Vermont Center Service Center has it up to 26 and a half months. And interestingly, when you check the websites, uh, one uh, for the processing times on USCIS.gov, one of the service centers gives it as fast as one week to give it approval uh, or decision, as opposed to maybe up to 14 and a half weeks on our site, which is kind of weird to say one week, but they say that. But you can expect a couple of months lag for a spouse of a green card holder, as opposed to a spouse of a US citizen for the I-130 petition. So what happens then? The case is approved with a spouse abroad, whether as a spouse of a green card holder or a spouse of a US citizen, the case has to transfer from USCIS to go to the State Department, and that's done by a group called the National Visa Center. USCIS ships out all the paperwork that you had upon approval to the National Visa Center, who does some more paperwork there. Once that's approved, they send it out to the US Embassy to do an interview. So there's a lot of timeline issues that pop up there. First of all, how long does it take for them to physically send the file from USCIS to the National Visa Center? That could be anywhere from one week or three months on average. So that's a uh, you know some time that's baked in there that, that's random. Also, you'll have situations where they lose the file or make mistakes. So I've had it where uh, they shipped the file to the National Visa Center and it was lost. So I have one case currently I'm dealing with where when we filed the I-130, we told USCIS that the foreign spouse is gonna do the embassy process, please send the file there. However, upon getting the approval notice, USCIS mistakenly said the spouse is in the United States and filing for adjustment of status from I-485, so they're gonna hold on to the case. I've been going back and forth for months now to get USCIS to release the file to send to the National Visa Center because that's what we requested. And every time I call them, they say, we don't have any information on this. It's the first time you're calling about this. So, you know, it's it's a big headache. It's a lot of back and forth. It's hours and hours on hold to get a, you know, a determination. But right now, this case, which should have, you know, completed the National Visa Center portion, hasn't even got to the National Visa Center, and it's been four months. So all of a sudden, we expect this case to go really fast, has some timeline set, but this unreliable factor popped in that really messed things up, and it's creating problems for us. Well, let's say, you know, USCIS sends the case out, the National Visa Center gets it, at that time you begin uploading government uh, documents to the government website, CEAC, CAC as we call it. And when you do that, you know, you have to have all the documents ready. So when I have clients, I usually try to pre-prepare them to have those ready. So once we get the okay to submit it, we could do it as fast as possible. But sometimes documents are ready. So there's a lag time that's created depending on how fast you get your documents together. But let's say you have everything ready, you upload it. Uh, the National Visa Center could take anywhere from a few weeks to a few months to approve the documents you sent. And if they have a problem with it, they'll ask you to resend stuff. So you have to resubmit it and then wait again for their determination. So that timeline is all over the place. It could be a few weeks to a few months. So that right there, you know, skews the timeline a lot. And these are things you don't have to explain to clients when they come and are asking for help in this area. So let's say the National Visa Center approves the documents and they say, okay, U.S. Embassy now has to see you. And that's this is where a lot of craziness pops up again. So the embassies are really busy. Now for COVID-19, they shut down. There's a huge backlog of cases. That packs a lot of extra work that they need to do, delaying everything. But let's say pre-COVID-19, uh, before all that happened, different embassies are busier than other ones. You may have an embassy that's not busy at all, and after the National Visa Center approves the case, a month later, they'll do the interview. Or you might have an embassy, uh, like for example, Iranians who need to go to the U.S. Embassy. There's no U.S. Embassy in that country. They have to go to Armenia, Turkey, or the United Arab Emirates, and Abu Dhabi in particular, and they have to talk with an officer that speaks Farsi. They don't have that many of those kind of officers. So there's a limited number of interviews for Iranians every month, which packs up and delays the time it takes for them to get an interview. Or the most, one of the worst ones is in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. So if you have to do your consular interview, uh, embassy interview in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, um, the backlog there could be a year sometimes after a National Visa Center approves the case. You might wait a year till they actually come and see you. So as you see, a lot of factors need to be known to be able to judge how long your case is gonna take uh, when it comes to being finished because some embassies might be a media month, some might be a year as the example I gave in Mexico. And that's why it becomes really hard when you put it all together, the I-130 could be longer, come short. How long it takes for USCIS to send the file to the National Visa Center could be long, it could be short. And then National Visa Center, how long are they gonna take? Once they're done with it, how long is the embassy gonna take to do it and to do their interview? And eventually when they do do their interview, how long is it gonna take for them to approve it? Sometimes they'll approve it on the spot but sometimes you might get stuck in what's called administrative processing. And they don't give us a reason why it's an administrative processing many times. A lot of times it's background checks, sometimes they ask you for more documents, or it could be other things we have no idea about. But administrative processing could be a week, two weeks. I've seen it be even three years before until they approved the case. So when the person you know, first came to me and I said, well, you're gonna do your interview, 
administrative process hits, it's open-ended how long that could take. Majority of cases are done within a month or two, but again, I've seen them go two or three years, and when the three years came up, it's not that they approved it. We had to file a lawsuit against the government for this unreasonable delay before they approved it. So, you know, when that couple came, imagine waiting three and a half, four years until they, from the time they started the process to the time that they're together in the United States. That's a long time, and it's hard to quote that. It's a rare thing, but it's not that rare in the, in the grand scheme of things. There's hundreds, if not thousands of people that go through that of the millions who go through this green card process. And so these are the timeline issues that really exist in this process that you have to be aware of. And this is part of the consultation session I have originally when clients come to me to explain to them uh, how long things could go because it's very important for them to judge where their life's going to go. They want to know how long they should wait. They might want to have kids, enroll their kids in school, start a new job, buy a new business. These fa timelines are a really important factor and just being separated from each other is really hard that these factors exist. Now I'll briefly talk about the K-1 fiance visa. It's not one of my favorite visas. I think usually in most cases marriage green card is more appropriate. But the K-1 visa has an initial step just like the marriage cases for the I-130, they have the I-129F, and the timelines for that are very similar. Where it shifts and is different with um, the K-1 fiancé visa as opposed to a, a marriage concert processing case is that once the initial step is approved, the relationship is believed, uh, the, the time to get an interview is usually a one to three months faster than a marriage case. Because a marriage case, you have to upload documents to SEAG, deal with the National Visa Center, but for a fiancé visa, the National Visa Center just gets the documents and sends it over to the embassy, and you schedule a time with that embassy depending on how busy they are, and you take your documents directly to them instead of having the National Visa Center be a middleman for that. And because the National Visa Center is not a middleman there, that's what saves the time in these kind of cases. So people are always in a rush to say, I wanna do a fiancé visa. That might save you one to three months. It's not that big a deal because the downside of it is once you do get the visa, the K-1 visa, and you enter the United States, you have to then get married within a year and then file for adjustment of status in the United States and then wait longer. As I talked about in the first uh, step of this, you might wait a year even to get an interview just to get your green card. And in between that time, it'll take a long time to get a work permit, travel permission, you're stuck in the United States. It's very stressful, very annoying. That's why usually I don't recommend doing the K-1 fiancé visa for nine out of 10 cases, but you know, if you're interested in that, the one out of 10 may just be you. So that's a big, a quick synopsis of how uh, the, the marriage cases work if you're doing it overseas or in the US, or if you're doing it based on marriage to a green card holder as opposed to a US citizen, and also the K-1 fiance visa. The next questions that come up always are what about the work permit and travel permission, what's called advanced parole. Because if you apply for a green card within the United States, whether you know, you're know you in the United States and you apply for a green card uh, based on marriage, or you are a fiance had entered, once you start the process, you're not allowed to travel overseas before you're getting a document called advanced parole, or if your green card is issued before that. Also, the work permit itself is something people urgently want to also get a social security number with that if they didn't have a social security number or work permit beforehand. So in those kind of cases, what I tell people is, you know, when I first started in this game, it used to be around two months to get the advanced parole travel document or the work permit. Usually 99% of the time they're approved at the same time. It usually took around two months. But in the last couple of years from 2018, 2019, 2020, uh, it's been taking around six months on average, I would say. Even though the government says it takes three to six months, I would go on the high side and say probably around six months, could be longer, I've seen it go longer, but I would wait six months uh, before anything. I wouldn't be surprised if it took uh, six months to get the EAD AP combo card sent to you. So be prepared for that kind of stuff. Now, another thing that pops up is the social security number. When does that come? Well, uh, if you're uh, doing the embassy process and you get the green card approved from the embassy and you're coming to the United States, as soon as you fly in, historically, about two to three weeks later, you'd have the social security number along with the green card itself mailed to you to your address. However, recently, social security office has sometimes not been sending it. I have clients waiting for months without getting it. Uh, and so they have to follow up directly with the social security office to get it. And also the green card itself, which is supposed to be mailed to you a few weeks afterwards, if you pay the green card fee before arriving, that sometimes, very few times, but could take six, eight, nine, ten months, I've seen that happen before, or just get lost in the mail. So all that is possible. It's not. It's rare, but it's normal enough. I see it frequently enough where I'm not surprised when that does happen. So as I mentioned earlier, I want to make that brief point. If you are doing consular processing and entering the United States to get your green card after an interview at the embassy, you have to pay that fee that they have there before coming in. It's very important you pay that ELIS or ELIS fee, I think it's called, or uh, for the, the green card printing before you enter to avoid additional delays. Now, having said all this stuff, 
you always have to remember immigration is a political animal and that affects things greatly. So as of the recording of this, we have several travel bans that have been imposed by the president that prevent many people from coming to the United States even if they had a successful interview. Now usually they have carve outs for if you're a spouse of a US citizen, sometimes, most of the time if you're a spouse of a green card holder, but even rare uh, spouse of a K-1 visa holder. So let me give you some examples. Um, there was a travel ban, again, many countries in the Middle East, including Iran, that travel ban did not have any exception. So even if you're married to a US citizen, uh, it wouldn't matter, you would get hit by that and you'd be held back until they do additional processing and background checks on you. However, there was an immigrant visa trial ban that came uh, because of COVID-19, but there was an exception in that for spouses of US citizens, but not spouses of uh, green card holders. So green card holding spouses are hit, and after the interview, they just have to wait until they could come to the United States until that ban is over. There's also a non-immigrant visa overview that happened. The K-1 fiance visa is considered a non-immigrant visa. However, the non-immigrant visa uh, did not specify or include the K-1 itself. It included H visa, L visas, work visa categories. So they shouldn't have been hit, they should be okay. But some embassies consider the K-1 fiance visa an immigrant visa even though um, by law, by statute, it's considered a non-immigrant visa. And I'm getting into technical stuff about how the law is written, but some embassies mistakenly said, well, a fiance visa is an immigrant visa. They're not married to the US citizen yet, so they're hit by this travel ban and we're not gonna do an interview or schedule an interview at all or, or, or approve them after the interview. And so then we have to challenge them. So as you see, practically speaking, despite what the laws are, despite what reality is, there's always human error that comes into play and human politics that come into play that could disastrously affect the timelines and the case. And you have to be prepared for that from the very beginning of the case. A few more notes I wanted to make. Uh, many people ask, when am I gonna get my biometrics appointment? If you're applying for the green card in the United States, that fingerprint appointment is really important to get the process started because your background checks are associated with that and it hurries up the process of getting the work permit. Historically, those would come one or two, the, the appointment notice would come one to two months after filing the case. With COVID-19, those shut down and now they're backed up and they're doing them slower for personal health reasons. Uh, but I'll be surprised if it doesn't come or it takes later. Just keep an eye out. If you do get that notice, you have to appear. If you miss it twice, it could lead to a cancellation and denial of your case. Also, something I referenced in the beginning of the video is for people who need waivers, those could take a long time as well. So if you enter the United States without permission and you're gonna do an I-601A waiver, a provisional waiver while you're here, those are taking a long time right now easily 11 to 19 months according to USCIS. Could be faster, could be slower, um, but that takes a while. However, if you're doing a regular I-601 waiver, if you're at the embassy, uh, that could take less time, maybe around three to six months. But once it's approved, you have to get another embassy appointment. And if you're in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, waiting for another appointment could take a long time. If you're doing it in the United States, filing for that waiver, essentially at the interview or along with your case, there could be longer delays and it's unclear. They say three to six months, could, have, could but it could be longer for the waiver to be approved. It always depends on these officers. And they have a huge amount of discretion. They're busy. And so these timelines don't always match up to what you know, they want it to be. And it varies on every single case. Now I wanna do one quick note about the removal of conditions from I-751. These are for people who get the marriage green card after uh, their marriage was only valid for less than two years. Essentially, they got married and got the green card less than two years later. They get a conditional green card. We have to resubmit paperwork two years later to be able to keep the green card. And this is a big issue because there's huge delays in this process. Now, I usually get my case approved after seven, eight, or nine months in the last few of them that I did. Um, however, the average is really between one to two years. So if your case is taking one to two years, that's not abnormal. Now, not every I-751 removal of condition case requires an interview. You may not require an inter interview, but if you do, that'll take longer because you have the schedule for one. And once you go there, it may take longer for an officer to approve it for a myriad amount of reasons, various kind of reasons. Um, but if you are waiting one year, one year and a half, that's normal and, and it just takes that long sometimes. So in a quick conclusion, uh, the core of it is if you're doing a marriage green card case and you're doing it in the United States, historically one year was a good time, but it could be longer or shorter. And if you're doing it through the embassy between one and two years, uh, if you're married to a citizen or maybe two years or a little bit more if you're doing it as uh, married to a green card holder. Those are the quick answers, but again, I did this whole video just to bring home the point that it could vary drastically depending on who the officer is, what issues you have, what issues the officer has, and a whole mess of other stuff. So be prepared for a wait. Don't try to think about the time. So try to focus on things to take your mind off this because unfortunately, you have no control over the timelines. Unless it's been exceptionally long, maybe you can file a complaint and request it to be expedited 
or you could you know, contact the ombudsman for unreasonable delay, or if really needed, file a lawsuit against them to get the process concluded. It doesn't always go positively, but it could lead to a conclusion so you know what's going on with your case. Thank you so much for listening to this video. If you haven't already, download the Ultimate Marriage Green Card eBook. I wrote it, it's the best out there, it's free. Go to marriageimmigrationlaw.com slash eBook to download the Marriage Green Card eBook and get a good strategy, good idea of what's going on with the case before consulting with an immigration lawyer. I'm John Kasrav. I'll be managing attorney of the JQK Immigration Law Firm. My email is info at jqklaw.com. Please reach out, email us if you're interested in scheduling a consultation. And until then, I wish you all the best. Bye-bye.